The local pizza shop has served its last slice. And some Waynesburg students got to see Hamilton. Welcome to Channel 14 News. I'm Nicholas Callis. And I'm Zach Schneg. A beloved pizza shop closed in Bellevue. Megan Cook talked to the locals about the treasured eating spot. In small towns like Bellevue, there is usually a neighborhood hangout. And for 42 years, that place was Luigi's Pizzeria and Ristorante on Lincoln Avenue. But after today, Luigi's is turning off its pizza oven. Luigi Della Ragione from Naples, Italy, was a waiter on a cruise ship before he opened his restaurant in 1977. Luigi's daughter, Christine, traveled from Georgia for the restaurant's final days. Well, I was two when he opened up his first shop, but it was not in this location. It was actually uh, on the corner. And I just remember hanging out in there and watching all the teenagers hanging out in, on the corner. And um, today I've been hearing like stories and memories of people reminiscing from all the time, just enjoying the well, Luigi's is the first pizza I ever had in my life. We never ever eat pizza until we came here. So that's really kind of an awesome memory. The day felt like a high school reunion for a lot of the dedicated customers, remembering their time as teenagers. Every basketball game we came with the Luigi's, after every football game we came with the Luigi's, so it was always that hang on after uh, sporting events. <laughs> Everyone was shocked to hear the news that the business was closing and so many rushed to get their final tastes. I couldn't believe it. I'm just it had to come for one more time because it's just been part of the family for four years. I'm with the nieces and nephews and grandchildren and all of them. Uh, I kept trying to call and call and I checked Facebook and they said they weren't taking any more orders at like 8 o'clock. So I didn't even try. I figured I'd, first thing in the morning I'd come today. Luigi's ran on a limited menu for its last days, but due to the impact and popularity of the restaurant, customers waited hours for their food. Uh, it's been over an hour. I placed my order uh, an hour ago and they said it would be 45 minutes. So. Is it worth the wait though? Oh yeah, yeah. It's the last time you're going to be able to get one, so definitely worth the wait. Today was very emotional with a hefty helping of handshakes and hugs. It's very emotional. It's emotional for my dad. It's emotional for me. Um, it's a, he's a legend in this town, and it's the end of an era here in Bellevue. And um, you know, there's lots of memories that everybody has, and stories that are going to keep on going. Um, so it's sad. It's sad. But on the other hand, my dad would love to retire, and this is the time to do it. This time. One thing that patrons and employees alike can't stop saying is, "Thank you." Thank you for the wonderful 42 years. I'm Megan Cook reporting. A couple weeks ago, student services sold tickets to the wildly popular Broadway show Hamilton. Megan Cook went to see the stunning show. Hamilton is Lin-Manuel Miranda's second Broadway smash hit. The musical about founding father Alexander Hamilton won 11 Tony Awards in 2016. The second tour of the musical stopped in Pittsburgh for nearly a month from January 1st to January 27th. One thing audience members at the Benedum Center had in common was that they all had to wait for it. The line to get through security, their opportunity to see the show, the merchandise table, and of course, the bathrooms. Waynesburg University's Student Activities Board was able to buy a group of tickets and sold them to students for a discount price of $50 each. I heard about the show a couple years ago when it first started um, hitting Epic and everything, and then um, probably, yeah, it was probably the beginning of November, middle of November, when the school announced that they were selling tickets for um, 50 bucks, and at that price, I was like, okay, I want to go. The catch for these students, however, was that the school was only able to secure 38 tickets. So, due to the high demand and low availability for purchase, several students camped outside the student services office so they did not throw away their shot. Um, I slept on the floor of Stover and I was one of the first 38 people. I think I was like number 21 or something like that. We camped out together yeah. too in Stover. Yeah, so, that's rough. yeah. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, but it's worth it. So, yeah. yeah. Using hip hop and rap music, the musical provides a history lesson to the audience. But I took AP US history, but I never know, knew how important it was until like I listened to the musical and I was like, wow, this guy's like super important to our government. Before leaving the venue, audience members got a chance to check out the merchandise table. I got a shirt and a magnet for my mom because she was super jealous. I got the opportunity to go and I got a program. Um, I got a magnet and some buttons. Outside the room where it happens, 
I'm Megan Cook, WCTV. Waysburg University held its annual faculty and alumni concert. Nick Callis was there to capture all the music. Several students and a few others outside of campus came to see the faculty alumni concert this past Friday at the Goodwin Performing Arts Center, an event that only happens on few and far occasions. We've had this particular recital every other spring for the last probably five or six years. All types of musicians performed, including a jazz group, soloists, a quintet group, a clarinet player, dual pianists, and even two opera singers. One current Waynesburg University musician, Trey Thomas, came to the concert. I think it went so amazing. It was literally so, so good. Like some of the performance, like it just blows my mind sometimes how like great our faculty can be when we only see them in the teaching position, but like seeing them in their element performance is just amazing. Even Sam Jones, Waynesburg University's women's basketball coach, was in this concert playing the trumpet in the opening act. I love Coach Jones. <laughs> um, I knew that he played and uh, we've been talking about doing some, some things and finally we had a faculty brass group and I said, hey, are you interested in playing with this? And he said, I am, but I haven't played in a while. For WCTV News, I'm Nicholas Callis. Waynesburg students traveled to Pittsburgh to cheer on the Penguins. Lindsay Stanger was there to catch all the action. Waynesburg University students took advantage of the cheap seats this past Tuesday. The students traveled to PPNG Paint Arena to watch the Pittsburgh Penguins take the ice. Student services offer a wide variety of opportunity for students to partake in activities they most likely would not without it. I think this is a really good opportunity for anybody that loves sports or hockey and wants to get a good deal. Um, this is my first time coming here with the school and I would definitely come again just because everybody, uh, everybody has a good time and hockey is really fun. Last Thursday, Waynesburg students took a break from their busy lives and drank some coffee and enjoyed some cookies as the band Nelly's Echo performed for everyone at the latest coffee house. The band played some popular tunes that everyone knew and sang along as well. They also played some original music and a good time was had by all. That's it for Campus News. When we return, we will have news from around the nation here on Channel 14. The snow is melting, but that doesn't mean that we're not getting any more precipitation. Flash flood warnings throughout Greene County until 1 o'clock earlier today, and the streams are still piling up. I'll have that and more in the five-day weather forecast. Back in seventh grade, a kid from England used to drop books on my head. When I was little, a kid used to lock me in the closet for hours. Back in middle school, I got made fun of for my weight. I used to get bullied in elementary school because of my height. Back when I was in high school, I used to, uh, you know, push kids into lockers, make them buy me chips, stuff like that. But uh, I've regretted it ever since. The man accused of killing 11 worshipers at a Pittsburgh synagogue last October appeared in court Monday for a brief arraignment. 46-year-old Robert Bowers faces 63 counts, including federal hate crimes and firearms offenses. He pleaded not guilty Monday and requested a trial. Federal prosecutors say Bowers stormed the Tree of Life synagogue and opened fire. A law enforcement official says he made anti-Semitic statements during the shooting and targeted Jews on social media. The Anti-Defamation League says the attack appears to be the deadliest on the Jewish community in U.S. history. 
The United States Department of Justice is considering whether to seek the death penalty against Bowers. His lawyers say they hope to resolve the case without a trial. Virginia's lieutenant governor can breathe a little bit easier this morning as Virginia delegate Patrick Hope says articles of impeachment that were originally planned for a Monday morning release will now be put on hold. John Lawrence reports. Justin Fairfax, the lieutenant governor of Virginia, accused of sexual assault by two women, one a rape. When you have uh, now uh, more than one credible allegation, the last one which has been corroborated at the time, um, he has to resign. And I think we as a party need to, need to demonstrate that there's not space for that. Virginia delegate Patrick Hope says Fairfax should be removed from office. Fairfax admits to encounters with the women, but says everything was consensual. He's calling for a thorough, independent, and impartial investigation of these allegations. As Fairfax fights for his political life, Governor Ralph Northam remains defiant in the face of his scandal, saying he won't step down. There's a theory of damage control in these kinds of scandals that says that if you just weather the storm and disappear for a while, you can come out the other end several weeks or, or months later and people will have cooled down. He's been under pressure to resign because of a blackface photo that appeared on his page in a medical yearbook decades ago. Time will tell if these scandals will have a long-term effect on the party. They could, in theory, hand the state, which had been trending Democratic, back to Republicans for a long time. I'm John Lawrence reporting. The state's attorney general, Mark Herring, has also said he wore blackface at a party in 1980. President Trump's former personal lawyer is postponing his testimony before Congress again. Michael Cohen's attorney said Monday his client won't attend Tuesday's scheduled appearance before the Senate Intelligence Committee. This is the third delay this month. The attorney said the latest delay is due to a medical issue. There is no word on when Cohen's testimony might happen. On March 6th, he is expected to report to prison. Cohen still hasn't began his three-year sentence for tax crimes, campaign finance violations, and lying to Congress in 2017. Public health officials are blaming a spike in teen tobacco use on vaping and e-cigarettes. In a new report Monday, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say there was a nearly 80% jump in e-cigarette use among high schoolers from 2017 to 2018. The report linked the rise to the popularity of Juul, a type of e-cigarette that uses flavored nicotine pods. A co-author of the report says the rise of vaping is the single biggest jump in teen use of a tobacco product since they started the survey in 1999. Juul did not respond to CNN's request for comments about the CDC's report. A woman accused of trying to help cover up her baby grandson's death was released from a Texas prison Sunday. Beatrice Sampaio is charged with tampering with evidence in the death of eight-month-old King J. Davila. The father, Christopher Davila, faces a series of charges, including felony injury to a child causing serious bodily injury and child endangerment. Davila claims his son fell off a bed last month and landed face first on the floor. He says he was too afraid to call 911, and when he checked on him a few hours later, he was pronounced dead. He's accused of staging a kidnapping to cover up the death with the help of other family members. Police ended up finding the child's body in a backpack buried in an open field near the father's home. The grandmother was being held on a $250,000 bond, but a judge reduced it to $50,000 on Friday. She was released from jail on bond less than 48 hours later. The child's mother and another relative also faced a charge of tampering with evidence, which is a third-degree felony. Monday was the day bipartisan negotiators were supposed to announce a deal to avert another government shutdown at the end of the week. Instead, there are no clear answers as to how or if another government shutdown can be avoided. Christopher, or Kristen Holmes has the latest from Washington and the sticking points that could lead to another shutdown in just a few days. Time is running out. Democrats and Republicans scrambling to avoid another government shutdown. And all optimism once surrounding the negotiations has faded. I think the talks are stalled right now. The impasse over two key issues. The first, how many undocumented immigrants can be held in detention centers used by Immigration and Customs Enforcement. A key Democratic negotiator saying that a limit on those held would, quote, force the Trump administration to prioritize arresting and deporting serious criminals, not law-abiding immigrants. 
Republicans calling the cap a non-starter, arguing it would force ICE officials to make impossible decisions about which immigrants to detain. The second, how much money should go into a border wall or barrier. Key lawmakers set to meet Monday afternoon, hoping to revive talks and make new progress in order to hit the Friday deadline and keep the government open. The White House not ruling out another shutdown. So you asked me a question, yeah. is a shutdown entirely off the table? The answer is no. If no deal is reached, 800,000 federal workers could find themselves furloughed again or asked to work without pay. Meanwhile, President Trump is in El Paso, Texas, Monday for his first political rally of the year, making his case once again for the border wall. I'm Kristen Holmes reporting. California's governor is redeploying over 300 National Guard members. Gavin Newsom says he has stopped his earlier authorization to add more California National Guard to the border. Instead, he will redeploy those 360 troops from other operations to, quote, focus on actual threats facing the state. Newsom says that includes supporting preparation for the upcoming fire season, expanding the counter drug task force, and conducting operation against drug cartels. According to the excerpts released from Newsom's State of the Union address, he plans to say that, quote, the border emergency is a manufactured crisis and California will not be part of this political theater, end quote. Presidential candidate Senator Kamala Harris is openly supporting the legalization of marijuana. In a radio interview Monday, Harris said she tried a weed, a joint specifically, in college. She also said that marijuana should be moved on the schedule and legalized so more research can be done. Harris said cannabis, quote, gives a lot of people joy and we need more joy, end quote. Harris's stance aligns herself with a growing movement in the Democratic Party and some Republicans to legalize marijuana. Right now, the Drug, Drug Enforcement Agency classifies marijuana as a Schedule I substance, which is in the same group as heroin. Schedule II drugs include cocaine and methamphetamine. That's it for news around the nation. When we return, Megan Cook will tell you about a special gift people are getting their exes this Valentine's Day. Don't go anywhere. You're watching The Buzz, your place for all things Waynesburg. I'm Lindsay Stinger, your campus news host. My name is Brian Bauer. I'm Andrew Sloboda, your entertainment host. My name is Corey Tretinick, and I'm here with this week's entertainment news. It's all of your beeswax. I'm Megan Cook with your business and entertainment update. It took more than 24 hours for Wells Fargo to restore services to all of its customers, following a massive power outage at a data center. Most of those affected were left without a plan B to check their accounts or even take out necessary cash. In today's Consumer Watch, what experts say you should do now to prevent another emergency bank outage. The recent Wells Fargo outage left millions of customers unable to access their accounts, which caused widespread panic. Experts don't expect this to be a one-time thing and advise consumers to get ready for the next tech failure. The, the government shutdown and this Wells Fargo incident kind of gave us a little bit of a preview of coming attractions. So what should you do when all online systems are down and you need cash now? Experts at comparecards.com recommend taking these three steps to prepare for a bank outage. Number one, keep some cash on hand and save for a rainy day. When the inevitable glitch or the inevitable snafu happens with bank technology, it can make for a really messy situation. Step two, review your records. This means checking your bank statements on a weekly basis to quickly spot an unauthorized transaction and then combat fraud. What you're looking for are charges that you don't recognize, even if they're very small, or an account that you don't recognize on your credit report. Step three, set up a backup bank account. Experts say it's a smart idea to spread your money around so you can access it when you need it most and make money in the process. Savings interest rates can really, really vary, so it's important that you do your homework 
when you're looking around for an account. And also guard against fraud with strong passwords. For Consumer Watch, I'm Meredith Wood. Still bitter about your ex? The El Paso Zoo in Texas has a pretty good idea to get over him or her just in time for Valentine's Day. So good, it had to stop the campaign early. Last week, the zoo posted on Facebook that you could name a cockroach after your ex and then watch it be fed to a meerkat on Valentine's Day. The campaign became so popular that several days after the original post, the zoo had to stop accepting names. But still, if you were one of the lucky ones that got your ex's name in on time, the zoo will be feeding your roach to a meerkat and other animals. And you can watch live on via live stream on Valentine's Day. The New York Times reports chi rappers Childish Gambino, Kendrick Lamar, and Drake turned down offers to perform at the Grammys this year. The show's longtime producer Ken Ehrlich told the publication he offered the rappers possible performance slots on Sunday night's show, but they declined. Ehrlich told the paper, quote, The fact of the matter is that we continue to have a problem with the hip-hop world. When they don't take home the big prize, the regard of the Academy and what the Grammys represent continues to be less meaningful to the hip-hop community, which is sad, end quote. Lamar led the Grammy nominations this year with eight nominations. He was followed by Drake with seven. Childish Gambino had five. The Recording Academy has made an effort to diversify its membership after complaints. The Grammys are not an even playing field for women and minority artists. CNN has reached out to the three rappers and Recording Academy for comment. McDonald's has donut sticks. The fried dough rods come in packs of 6 or 12 and served warm with cinnamon and sugar. McDonald's is hosting, hoping that they'll boost breakfast sales, which have slipped in recent years amid growing competition from rival fast food restaurants. The Golden Arches announced back in October that it would expand its breakfast menu, but did not elaborate at the time. It's unclear if anything else will be added to its breakfast menu. And although McDonald's now offers all-day breakfast, Items, the donut sticks will only be available during regular breakfast hours. Today's movie news includes the latest big awards winners and a new look at a certain flying elephant. Here's David Daniel with the Hollywood Minute. My Another big win for Roma. The Alfonso Cuaron movie was named Best Film at the BAFTA Awards. Cuaron also won the Directing and Cinematography Prizes. The favorite led the way with seven BAFTA Awards, including Leading Actress for Olivia Colman and Supporting Actress for Rachel Weisz. Rami Malek won Leading Actor for Bohemian Rhapsody, while Mahershala Ali captured Supporting Actor for Green Book. And, and now, introducing our world-famous Here's your latest look at Dumbo. Tim Burton's take on the classic Disney tale opens March 29th. He won't fly without a feather. Hmm. All right, Dumbo, give me a showstopper. Fly, Dumbo. You've made me a child again. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. That'll wrap it up for business and entertainment. Dakota Kiefer has your latest in Waynesburg Sports on Channel 14 News. You don't know what's going to happen with the hurricane. You cannot predict its path. And he didn't clearly understand what his job was there to do. And that's sad because he's just a statistic now. Total lunacy. It's an alarming statistic. That ended up winning the National League to face the Red Sox in the World Series. But clearly he didn't understand the context of the speech. If you haven't heard me talk about this yet, uh, I'm sorry. Take the time and do what makes you happy. Good evening. I'm Dakota Kiefer with your WCTV Sports Report. 
The Waynesburg University men's basketball team traveled to St. Vincent College this past Saturday to take on the PAC leading Bearcats. The outcome changed the playoff picture for the Jackets. I was there to cover the game. The Waynesburg University men's basketball team traveled to St. Vincent this past Saturday to take on the PAC leading Bearcats. It was a challenging day for Waynesburg as St. Vincent had its best player back in Tom Kromka. Kromka had a good return for the team putting up 12 points. Waynesburg on the other hand struggled to find their footing as they were down 24-9 at one point early on and were trailing 50-24 at half. Having Kromka back definitely helped down low as St. Vincent was able to out-rebound Waynesburg 47-19. But St. Vincent also shot very well from behind the arc, making 11 three-pointers. Waynesburg, on the other hand, didn't have anyone in double figures as Brennan Smith and Matt Popek led the team in scoring with 9 points each. The Jackets ultimately fell 88-60 in a rough display. Waynesburg fell to 7-16 overall and 6-8 in PAC play and in 6th place in the President's Athletic Conference. For WCTV, I'm Dakota Kiefer. The Jackets are back in action at home tomorrow night against Teal. The women's basketball team also made the trip to St. Vincent to take on the PAC leading Bearcats. The outcome left the Jackets in 7th place in the PAC. Chase Johnston has more on the Jackets' performance. The Waynesburg University women's basketball team traveled to St. Vincent College this past Saturday to take on the PAC leading Bearcats. It was a tough outing for the Yellow Jackets as St. Vincent sophomore forward Madison Collier scored 24 points, shooting 11 of 18 from the field. Waynesburg struggled to get in the rhythm as they trailed 41 to 28 and shot 9 of 25 from the field heading into halftime. Having Collier underneath helped the Bearcats out-rebound the Yellow Jackets 52-37. St. Vincent hit their shots when they needed to, hitting eight total threes in the game. Waynesburg, on the other hand, had three players in double figures. Andrew Rowoski led the team in scoring with 15 points, and Aaron Joyce and Haley Porter chipped in with 11 and 10. The Yellow Jackets fell in a tough road game 80-57. to Waynesburg falls to 7-16 and overall and 5-9 and in PAC play and 7th in the President's Athletic Conference. For WCTV, I'm Chase Johnson. The Lady Jackets are also back in action against Teal tomorrow evening. The Waynesburg University wrestling team three-peated as PAC champions this past Friday at Teal College. It not only won a team record third straight title, but it did it in very dramatic fashion. Just after the consolation finals, the Jackets thought that they were down by 13 points, with Washington and Jefferson putting eight wrestlers into the finals. The three head coaches and other officials would have a meeting that ended up resulting in Waynesburg only being down four points. In the finals, redshirt freshman Dylan Williams won the 125-pound title by pin. Waynesburg also won the 133-pound and 141-pound titles as well with Josh Kuslock and Matt Lascola, winning those respectively. The 174-pound class was a dire need for Waynesburg to keep its hopes alive, and freshman Tony Welsh did just that by winning in an 8-3 decision. The contest was then in the hands of the best Division III heavyweight wrestler in the nation, senior Jake Evans, who sealed the victory for Waynesburg after he pinned WNJ freshman Jake Walker in 1 minute and 23 seconds. That win also gave Evans his fourth PAC title as well as an NCAA record in all divisions for most career wins with 175. Waynesburg had a couple of days to savor its victory and will be completing the regular season tomorrow with a senior night match against Division II West Liberty. That's all for sports. Stay tuned because Brandon Rossi will have your five-day weather forecast for you next on WCTV. Welcome into another edition of Jagged Sports Weekly. The homecoming game against Carnegie Mellon. And finally, Hugh, we're starting to see this offense put together some drives and really... We kind of saw the offense just compile together and have a great showing. Chad Walker, 61 rushing yards and a touchdown. And the receivers, it just wasn't one main guy. It was Cole Booth, John. 25-23 and 25-18. to But perhaps the biggest takeaway in that match, all of whom had season highs. They only had one block in the entirety of the match. We, um, we run our best race at regionals. We can make it to national. You see him. We saw him a couple weeks ago. Game-clinching interception for the football team. There are little things that you can do to help you when you're driving a car, but the one thing that you shouldn't do when driving a car is texting and driving. 
In fact, at any given time throughout the day, approximately 660,000 drivers are attempting to use their phones while behind the wheel of an automobile. And 11 teens die every day as a result of texting while driving. According to the National Safety Council, 25% of all automobile crashes are related to cell phone use. Don't text and drive. <laughs>With your five-day weather forecast, I'm Brandon Rossi. And now that we're over the unusually warm weather, it's unfortunately time to get back to reality. This week, we've got all sorts of bipolar weather, as you can see on your screen, beginning with rain today with a high of 49. There was a flood watch in effect earlier today until about 1 o'clock, so somebody might want to check on Wiley Stadium and make sure it isn't the Waynesburg Community Pool at this point. Tonight, that rain will switch to snow, but... That's not going to happen until overnight. There will be some higher wind gusts whipping on your dorm wall, so be on the lookout for that while you're trying to sleep. The low will also reach 27 degrees. Those snow showers will carry over into tomorrow morning, but eventually will give us overcast skies with a steady high of 31 degrees. The low is not going to dip down too drastically at just 27, and there will be partly cloudy skies, but also a lot of wind yet again. On Valentine's Day, you won't necessarily need to give your boo your coat to keep her warm since the temperatures will pinnacle at 50 degrees. The sun will also peak out here and there to, get to give even the single folks like me some literal sunshine on a cloudy day. However, when you're taking your date out, keep the umbrella on standby. There's an 80% chance of rain mainly later at night, but hey, this could be a chance to go singing in the rain. The aftermath of the most overrated holiday of the year is a wet one. Mostly cloudy skies on Friday with rain in the morning, but nothing too bad looking for a high of 47. You may or may not see some snow mixed in sporadically throughout the day, but for the most part, the upper 40 degree temperatures should keep the flakes away. At night, we've got cloudy skies and yet another 27 degree low. Seems to be a theme here. And this weekend is a chilly one. On Saturday, we'll be awoken to cloudy skies possibly bringing in some snow, but I wouldn't hold my breath per se. The high reaches 35 degrees, but it may feel just slightly warmer when the sun shines blissfully throughout Greene County. The moon will also be glowing with no clouds in sight on a very chilly 22 degree night. And on Sunday, don't expect the sunshine to last very long. We'll be getting some on again, off again snow with a high of 37. We're expecting about one inch of snow, so get the snow boots and snow shovels ready to go. The snow will be more scattered once day turns to night with a low of 27. We have a 50-50 chance of snow at night, but again, don't be surprised if we're in the clear for Sunday night. And gentlemen, I don't know about you, but Valentine's Day, I hate it. It's the most overrated holiday ever. I don't know what you guys... Uh, I, I couldn't tell by that. By, <laughs> yeah, the, script there. by the weather but, report. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I mean, it's a car, it's a it's a holiday created by a card company. Okay. That's I'm all it is. My girlfriend might be watching, so we gotta keep this down. Anyway. <laughs> hey, so, uh, spread the hey, love, what's, what? Miss Zach <laughs> Schnag. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all good. Jeez. Hey, well, thank you for turning to Channel 14 News. Tune in every Tuesday at five for more news. This has been a production of Waynesburg Community Television.